there's this, uh, you probably all know the, the fact that multitasking is a fallacy, that we only do one thing at a time. So if I try to multitask, it's not going to go well. Uh, so let me just first say, this is a pretty intimate setting. So I'll try to leave some time for questions at the end. But uh, feel free to ask a question at, at any moment. Uh, actually, it helps me. Let me take a little bit of water. Uh, and uh, I'm not seeing the time running. So I don't know if you guys can set a timer. Uh, or if not, I'll just, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, so super quick, I'm uh, originally from Venezuela. I went to the US to, uh, to study um, initially math, then business. Um, and then I was very fortunate to ride the early wave of the internet, uh, starting uh, the first web, web analytics company back in 94, an email community company, and then um, just being active with a bunch of fabulous entrepreneurs. Uh, so up until a couple of years ago, I spent most of my time working with entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, helping them grow their companies, and I just mentioned a few of those uh, as, a, as background. A couple of years ago, uh, two things happened. Uh, one is I probably read too much science fiction, uh, and the other one is I, I saw a talk by David Eagleman at TED and got really excited about the possibilities of using technology uh, to enhance our capabilities. So for the past two years, I've been focused on trying to learn as much about the space, find the people that are doing interesting things in it, um, and um, if possible, get involved with it and, and help them out. Uh, okay, this said it's a little bit. And uh, yeah, my, my meditation is, is kite foiling, which I try to do most days in, in San Francisco. I highly recommend it for those of you who are. Uh, so what am I gonna talk about today? I'm, uh, during the past few years, I've seen dozens and dozens of projects. When I talk about human augmentation, I'll, I'll get more specific. Uh, but I've highlighted a few that I think are particularly interesting. Each one of those, I think, could be an entire talk. But uh, obviously, I'll just take a minute to do, or, or two, to do each one, just the most uh, relevant. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what's going on in terms of making these projects happen. Um, and if there's time left, I don't know if there'll be time left. But if there's time left, I might just talk a little bit about Silicon Valley, which I thought could be could be interesting. Um, one thing about uh, the kind of stuff that I work on is that I think most of the talks today and a lot of the people in this conference are focused on the molecules. So what are we putting into our body, whether it's through food and diet or through uh, uh, other specific things like nootropics, what have you. I tend to focus on, on bits. So what is the digital technology that we are using uh, to enhance our capabilities? and uh, these are the, the, the various areas that um, I've been focusing on. And uh, for each one of those, I picked one project that I find is, uh, could be interesting. And I've gone into a little more detail. Uh, sense substitution, which is how do we take our senses and use one sense to get either information from another sense or use one sense to get information from a sense that we do not have to augment our abilities to, to, to sense the world. Um, exoskeletons, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, bionics, I think it's also self-explanatory. Brain stimulation with things like uh, current um, TDCS. Uh, brain stimulation with, uh, without technology in, to a certain extent with things like music and, and spoken word and the like. Uh, sleep is huge. It's amazing how many, I'm currently looking at three separate sleep projects. Um, there's a great related project here in the expo which uh, talks about sleep. Um, hearables is, uh, I'm particularly interested because it's about enhancing our senses. There's a lot that's been done for the eyes. Um, I'm going to talk about haptics, which is our feel. Uh, but there's, uh, there's uh, uh, the hearing uh, is a sense that uh, hasn't been um, a lot of people haven't paid attention until now. Now there's some fascinating things going on, so I'm going to touch on that. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things that I don't focus on, but but I, I want I, I've been involved or, or or exposed to some interesting projects that, that I'm that I'm going to mention um, in things like bio wearables and some of the moonshots that are going on for the brain. All right, how are we doing? We're going. Remember. Oh, okay. Is that a question? No, it's just a thumbs up. Remember that questions really help me. Uh, all right. So let me jump into how many of you, by any chance, are familiar with the work of David Eagleman at Neosensory? Wow. So I cannot recommend David's TED Talk enough. Um, 
Uh, I happen to be fortunate enough to have been working with him now for a while and joined the board of his company. And what the work of David is all built around, you, on, uh, around the, the brain plasticity, which was mentioned in a previous talk, and the fact that uh, the brain learns new things throughout our lives. And in specifically, his work is about can we use haptics and, inform and information that comes through, through to the touch uh, through either augment our senses or give us, um, replace a sense. So this is a vest that Neosensory is producing, and the short version of it, you put a vest, it has 32 motors, and then you can hook it up to anything you want. And the first application is for people that have a disability, in this particular case, people that cannot hear. And the f f amazing thing is that you hook up uh, a, sp um, a microphone to the vest, and with a little bit of training, the, the people learn to understand what's being said just from what they're feeling. And the crazy thing is that you do the same for, for vision. So you're taking blind people, uh, hooking up a video camera to, to the vest, and after a little bit of training, guess what? The brain figures it out. Um, the, so there are a lot of amazing applications that Neosensory is working on to, for disabilities. To me, what's more exciting, I mean, I should say, I mean, that's fascinating. What got me into it, going back to augmentation, is can you use the best to take and add a sense. Um, and in the next slide, I'll show how we're taking and using the vest. Is streaming nine different measures from this quadcopter. So pitch and yaw and roll and orientation and heading. And that improves this pilot's ability to fly it. It's essentially like he's extending his skin up there, far away. And that's just the beginning. What we're envisioning is taking a modern cockpit full of gauges, and instead of trying to read the whole thing. So anyway, that was David talking, who's a much better speaker than I am. And um, yeah, the notion that you can take any information, and we've worked with financial information, with all sort of, with emotional information, and make it uh, so that it becomes second nature. Um, very, very interesting space. Um, there's another company, doing something similar, uh, which is a company called uh, Somatic Labs. If I can, uh, okay, let me give this a try. Oh, oh, there we go. Turn off the click track. Moment gives you a subtle, silent pulse, so you play in time. Moment helps you learn a new instrument or become a better musician. And in this case, it's a simpler thing. It's basically a wearable that instead of like most wearables that have one, uh, motor or a haptic engine, it has four. And, but, but that allows a lot more information, obviously, to be transmitted. And what they're trying to do is, OK, can I use that to enhance my, my sense of, of, of feeling? Um, and again, these are just two of the, what I think are the most interesting projects in, in the space. Um, but I'm pretty excited about the abilities of, en of um, enhancing our senses and, and adding senses, if you will. Uh, by the way, unfortunately, none of these products are yet released in the market, uh, but they're, they're pretty close uh, and, and so on. All right, let me move on to uh, exoskeletons. And uh, up high? Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Thanks for in the back. Um, so the challenge with exoskeleton historically has been that they actually um, make it they're so big, so heavy, so expensive, um, that they've only made sense for someone who's, say, paraplegic. And there's a company called, you know, there's EXO and, and, and a few other companies that do that. And they're, they're great. I mean, if you, if, if you can finally move a little bit, going from not moving to moving, that's fa fabulous. But until recently, there's been no ability to take someone who's healthy and use an exoskeleton so that they can use less energy to do something, that they can maybe run faster or, or hike higher. Um, than uh, with the same amount of, of, of energy. Um, one of the most pioneering companies that I've been working with in this space, a company called Rome Robotics, and um, what they've done is they say, well, well, let's go super light and super cheap. So their systems are made of a combination of fabric. So it's mostly fabric and pressurized air. Um, and so that cuts way down in the weight, and they've also cut down by two orders of magnitude in the cost of the prototypes. We're talking about an exoskeleton. Uh, the, the, the stuff for, in the market might, cut, might cost $100,000. Uh, 
And the price point that uh, Rome Robotics is going for is just a few thousand dollars, two or three thousand dollars. I actually um, tried, actually, let me show you uh, a demo of one that uh, they use. Um, so this is a soft fabric, as you can tell, and, and you can wear it anywhere. Um, and then, but once you pump air on it, it becomes pretty rigid. Um, so it's a great solution for something that's lightweight, that's affordable. Here you can actually see it in a, in a, in a hand prototype. Um, and um, although they are more focused on, on legs, and here you can see uh, a little bit of the kind of stuff that, that, that can happen. That's actually uh, accelerated. Uh, but, but I was at their lab uh, uh, last month, and I was wearing an exoskeleton, and I was on a treadmill, and I'm jogging. And I'm like, is this really working? Is this doing anything? So they dial it down. And I'm like, whoa, it, it was incredible. Um, now, again, to give you a sense, the kind of improvement that we're getting is 10% which might not sound like a huge amount, um, but in the right circumstances, it, it, it can make a really big difference. That's kind of like the state of the, the, you know, of the world in, 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 in terms of where we are. Um, all right, let me fast forward here. Next one. Uh-huh. Ooh. Ah. So Cambridge Biocommentation System is a uh, Fantastic company, actually. I, uh, it's my most recent uh, investment. And uh, when I started in this space, I was focusing, focusing exclusively on what can we do to take healthy individuals and, 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 and augment us or them. But what I realized is that a lot of these technologies are going to go first to people that have a disability. Because in the case of, say, prosthetic limbs, yes, I do believe that bionic arms are eventually might be better or will be better than natural arms, but who's ready, who's going to chop up an arm to put the, oh, I, I'm sure in this group, <laughs> yes, but uh, maybe the authorities might not let you do that just yet. Um, so I, I think that this is an example where, and by the way, brain is another area where you're seeing some really interesting stuff going on with implants in the brain that are only allowed if the person has, you know, seizures or something significant. It, it's not going to be allowed for healthy. Um, Cambridge Biogmentation is trying to become they call it the USB for the human body. And the premise is that currently all prosthetics and limbs, each is doing it their own way. And the most difficult aspect is the interconnectivity with the body, both physical and neurological. Um, and nobody's doing it particularly well. And these guys have come up with a universal interface that has both uh, the mechanical support with, with the titanium piece, but also will pr provide the the neurological information. And again, initially focus on people that, that need a prosthetic limb, but they already have uh, a roadmap for uh, measurements and all sort of, uh, I mean, it's Bluetooth enabled, et cetera, uh, all sort of things that are gonna work really well when those um, bionic limbs, if you will, get smarter and smarter. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating um, space. Uh, next one is a company that, uh, is focusing on TDCS, basically uh, electricity to the brain. And uh, this is a form factor they have. You basically, their ori original product was worn here, uh, user testing, I mean, that uh, wasn't being as well received, so they, they, they have a new version now coming out that goes in, in the neck. And, uh, and then an app that lets you decide what, what kind of mood do you wanna be in. Uh, and uh, the two main ones, they, they like to think about themselves as well. We're both digital caffeine um, or digital alcohol or marijuana, if you will. Um, so instead of a shot of espresso or so many other things that, as you know better than me, can be done, it's like, well, can I give myself a digital boost? And if I want to relax, then um, I do likewise. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. I want to share a little bit of uh, some um, results from a recent study. And I've seen this in a number of similar uh, products, which is two-thirds, it basically works for two-thirds of the people. Um, and many of these technologies, well, that particularly ones that are affecting the brain, it's not universal. They just do not work. Not everything works for everybody. Um, and in, in their case, now it's pretty encouraging that they're getting pretty good results for two-thirds. You know, the flip that is, let's keep in mind that there's, there's a third of the people for whom it doesn't work. Um, I'm cooperating with a Stanford researcher that works on hypnosis, and uh, we're working uh, on doing a self-hypnosis app 
to uh, help you in a number of things with addictions or, uh, or stress management, if you will. Um, and hypnosis is very similar. About for one third of, the, of people, it just doesn't work. They're not very hypnotizable. One third are super hypnotizable and one third are somewhere in the middle. So it, there seems to be, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's the same, uh, the same people, if you will. The, then the other area that I, that it's where there's a lot of activity. Actually, there's a company that just announced funding yesterday in this space is to use music and sounds to do pr basically the same uh, as, as TDCS is trying to do. And obviously, the, what, what's really nice about using music is we all have the hardware, we all have headsets and and, and iPhones, if you will. Uh, so no, you know, it's, it's, it's something that can be much more um, available to everybody. In this case, the guys from Brain.fm, um, and again, also company that, that is fundraising. Again, a lot of activity going on with, I mean, most, many of these companies, part of the reason I get in, involved with them or familiar with them is because uh, they're fundraising, although not, not all of them. Um, so they're working on a number of applications, and this is one where they're using this for sleep, um, and uh, combination of what they call 3D sound rotation and um, entrainment to basically uh, synchronize your waves, uh, your, your brain waves during deep sleep, enhance uh, deep sleep. Um, their results seem to be pretty, pretty encouraging. Um, on the sleep uh, front, and by the way, a lot of, uh, in terms of Brain FM, it, it also is very popular in Silicon Valley among developers for, uh, for focus. So put on the headsets. You know, we have lots of open spaces. Uh, I imagine, you know, a lot of startups here are the same. And uh, put on the headset and, and focus. Uh, for sleep, um, amazingly, in the last month, I've, I've gotten three pitches from three different companies uh, doing sleep hardware. Um, so I wanted to mention uh, a couple of these. Oh, actually, I'll mention three of them. One is a company called Sana. Sana is the one you can see there. Uh, that's uh, the guy who did Picard, who flew on the solar uh, power plane around the world. So he had to be there and, and, and time his sleep cycles uh, during this uh, round the world tour. And Sana is, is about putting you to sleep really fast. And, he, and the, the developer had some, had, had some seizures injury during the war. He's a, he's a war vet. And because of pain, couldn't fall asleep. But Sana uses uh, light in, in a way that seems to be very effective about putting putting you to sleep. It's, it's, uh, the, the device they're commercializing is, is the one on the top. Uh, Cocoon, which is actually a British company here, is, oh, by the way, Insana has, it's measuring hardware variability as a way of understanding what's going on and, and how to uh, do the right thing at the right time. A, a number of other devices are using EEG. So this is a, a device called Cocoon, and it's using EEG. Uh, instead of light, it's using sound. Uh, for the same kind of thing, try to maximize your sleep. Um, and then real quick, this is probably the company that's raised the most amount of funding, uh, a company called Rhythm out of France slash Silicon Valley, uh, very focused. And you can see the progression of their device, the challenge being, you know, how do we do something that's going to be comfortable while you're sleeping, but that it's going to be accurate EEG, um, and they're using bone conduction to send sound that is synchronized with, the, with what's going on in your brain during sleep, again, to try to um, make your, your sleep more effective. Um, it, it's a, an area of a lot of activity. I'm gonna pause while I drink a sip of water. So opportunity for any questions or comments or, by the way, if anybody here wants to add about, oh boy, what about this or that company? All right, I'll keep going then. Um, I mentioned hearables. Um, hearables is another area. Any of you have heard of Doppler Labs? A few of you, great. Um, so if, if, you, if you go back to part of what uh, Google Glass was trying to do, it was to give you a new, a, a new UX to the world. But we're already u we're using our vision a lot. So getting stuff in there um, can often be problematic and distracting. So there are a lot of people who are saying, well, what about hearing? Can we add a layer of sound that, if it's well done, can give us that kind of UX? So that's part of a company like Doppler is doing. Uh, the other thing they're doing is, I like to use the analogy of, if it's sunny, um, I might put on polarized glasses. And it cuts down on, 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 the, on the light. Um, because it's polarized and I'm a sailor, I can see the, the water better. But when it's noisy, just yesterday at the dinner, 
uh, we had to, I was talking with somebody and it was too loud and we had to stand outside. Well, if, if, if we all had been wearing Dopplers, you can program it to say, hey, cut out the noise and, and focus on the human voice next to me. Um, so they, they, that's part of what they're trying to do, a little the equivalent, if you will, of sunglasses, but for hearing. Um, the other thing that they do is to try to make uh, things sound better. So if you go to um, a concert and the concert happens to be in a dive club that doesn't have good sound, and then you say, make this sound like Carnegie Hall. And it's a, that's my favorite feature of it. It really sounds amazing. Um, it, actually, the first version they did of the Doppler device did not connect to your iPod, your, your, your MP3 player, or your iPhone. You could only use it to filter the physical world because they wanted to really emphasize that, that uh, use case. Uh, of course, now they, 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 they connect. Um, and again, I am taking one or two on each of these spaces, but just like there's Doppler, there is Bragi, there is um, Kanoa, there is uh, a bunch of other companies doing, doing, doing this. So I, I think it's going to be pretty real pretty soon. Um, Cybergness, I imagine some of you have heard of the work of um, Neil, Har Neil Harbison with the antenna. So um, he helped start his company. Uh, a lot about cyborgs, and there's something really fascinating about uh, what they're doing. So I was talking with, uh, uh, with Liviu, the, the CEO. This particular device, which is their first product, is called the North, and you pierce it. So it's a quasi-implant because you're piercing it, but it's, but it's permanent, um, and it vibrates when you're facing North. And, uh, you know, my honest reaction initially was that that's silly. I mean, we all have GPSs. This is the kind of thing that you're doing to be voyeuristic. Um, and you might still feel that way. But there was something really fascinating, which relates to, to the previous talk that he mentioned, which is that something that surprised him when he was wearing it is that, let's say he was giving this talk and that that's north. I have no idea which way north is, by the way. So when, which way is it? That way. That way, okay. So if I had... I was wearing one of these, then I would have noticed that that's north. Well, what, what he noticed was that his memories of events became richer because this was this anchor, this data point that he could remember. It's like, oh, when I was giving that talk, and that was north, and that that helped anchor the other things that were going on. And I can totally really, yeah. Um, also, uh, when I've worn one of these, uh -huh. this, but uh, prototype that Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, you, you internalize it for sure. Um, so anyway, a, a lot of, uh, uh, of um, I mean, this whole space of, Im of, of implantables and cyborgs, it's obviously super early. And most of what's going on has to do with art and voyeurism. Um, but, um, but I think slowly but surely we're seeing uh, some pretty compelling uh, use cases. Um, one other thing, this is one of my, this product hasn't been launched, it's called Feel, and it's a band that tries to determine your emotional state. And of course, we all know about heart rate variability and galvanic skin response, you know, like the, 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 ring, uh, the, the rings that measure that and so on, um, and, and temperature. A lot of companies are trying to say, can we take all that data to um, let you know your emotional state? And to me, that's interesting for two reasons. One is I ask, I have three kids, and I ask my kids, hey, if you could have a sixth sense, and this was more in the context of neosensory, uh, what would you like it to be? And to my surprise, my youngest son said, I want to know how people around me are feeling. It's like, wow, initially, so that's not what I meant. But then I go, oh, yeah, no, that could be a pretty cool sixth sense. Um, thinking outside the box, it's not, it's not just about having infrared vision, if you will. Um, so then my wife and I started brainstorming about this and say, how cool would it be if each of one of us is wearing something that measures our emotional state and communicating that to the other through haptics in real time? So that if I'm having uh, a meeting that's really interesting and I'm really excited, she would feel something. Um, so she's sharing a little bit of my life. So instead of the typical, at the end of the day, honey, how was your day? Well, same as usual. She go, hey, I noticed you were pretty excited around noontime. Who were you talking to? It's like, oh, I was out there. So, yeah, I know, no, no, no. But I thought here in Scandinavia that was totally cool, no? Um, well, the other use case is you use it when you're together, right? So you, 
you can give you, you you can't lie, right? You're giving yourself true, honest feedback. Am I liking what you're doing? I'm not liking what you're doing. Um, again, this product has to be launched. And to be perfectly honest, there's there are encouraging signs that this kind of stuff is going to happen. I still haven't seen it work. I mean, there are a number of companies trying to do it. There's a, the, the, the error rate is still high, but uh, again, we'll see.